be. Let's stand together. You know, I tried so hard this week to be good. I, I'm really wanting to be good enough to get to heaven, so I'm really working on this. Now, how many of you think I'm good enough to get to heaven? <laughs> You're saying, that's a trick question. I'm not sure if I have answer that one. Uh, no, the answer is I'm not good. God says that the Bible says that no one is good, right? And But where is my assurance this morning? Is it in my goodness? No way. There's no way I can do that. My assurance is my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ because he came and paid the price on the cross for my sin. And all I have to do is receive him and I have assurance of heaven. I have assurance I can be with him for eternity. Now, is that something to celebrate? ladies and gentlemen. Amen? All right, let's celebrate together, shall we? today we're so glad you're here if you're visiting we just want to just invite you to participate with us as much as you feel you want to in your bulletin as a communication card we'd love to get your name and just connect with you the rest of you you can fill one out too and if you have any prayer requests or praises you can fill that out um, so that the church can be praying for you on the rest of our announcements today, um, we're still doing our church member series. If you have not gotten your book, you can still see Carl and you can still get your book. And that's what we're going through for five more weeks, counting today and in your small groups as well. Coming up on the, the fifth Sunday in September is our fifth Sunday potluck. So, uh, yeah, 29th, that's what I thought it was. <laughs> Bring something to share so we can just fellowship. We had such a good time last week with our potluck. We can do it again. And then we also are still collecting our school supplies for Lincoln. And the last day is Tuesday, the 8th, 13th, by 3 p.m. Because we want to get those over to the school to bless those teachers before 
they actually have a classroom full of children. Um, and just keep, um, keep the school teachers and everybody, not just Lincoln, we want to keep the whole Magic Valley in mind. Keep them in your prayers as everybody's revving up to start a new, a new year. And in that, turn and greet somebody next to you and welcome them. Good morning. Okay, we can do better than that. Good morning. Hey, it's good to see each one of you here this morning at First B. If you, we want to take a moment because this next week school starts. Uh, the kids are like, "Uh," all the parents are like, "Praise God!" But, uh, but we want to pray over our students and we want to pray over teachers. So if you're here this morning and you are a student or a teacher, I'm going to ask you to come to the front really quickly. Just go ahead and make your way quick, quick, quick. If you're a student at the high school, or the junior high, yeah, come on. If you're a teacher or administrator, you can jump. That's You're young. You'll survive. You'll be good. All right. Well, we want to pray over these guys. We want to pray God's blessing. Yeah, they're like, oh, one teacher. I guess I better come. All right, come on. You got it. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> Miss Eaton. Okay. Is she a teacher, too, and she's hiding? Oh, she retired. Okay. Okay. All right. Well, church, let's do this. Why don't you stand to your feet? And we want to pray over these guys. So I'm going to ask you to pray in agreement for a great school year, a safe school year, uh, a year where God uses these kiddos and our teachers dynamically in a way to reach to and evangelize our community for Christ because they are lights in a world full of darkness. Amen? So they need all the prayer where they can get. So let's pray for them this morning, if you would. Join me in praying. Father God, I thank you for each one of these that are here represented today. Lord, as a, school, a new school season starts, I pray that you use each one of these students and teachers, administrators that know you as lights in the midst of darkness. Lord, I pray that they would be able to give advice and counsel. They would live in such a way that, Lord, you would uh, be seen in all they do and say. Father, I pray for safety and protection this year as they go to school. Lord, we don't take that for granted anymore as a nation. And, Lord, I pray your protection over each one. Lord, I thank you you go before them, and I thank you for this coming year, the promise that's there, the good you're going to do. May your hand of blessing, provision, and protection be on each one, we pray. In Jesus' matchless name, amen. Amen. Well, we stand with you. God bless you guys. Let's continue to worship. Thank you. Oh. Yeah, I just want to mention to you that this is our sax player's last Sunday with us, Jer. So let's give it up for Jer. Thank you, Jer. <laughs> I've worked with these guys for two years, and I've had a blast. What a, what a sweet group we have up here. Have you noticed that? It's a great group. All right, let's worship the Lord together.
a scripture together. Let's all read this together, shall we? Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last times. Isn't that great news? I've been held by the Savior. I felt fire from above. I've been down to the river. Yes, I have. Now I ain't the same. A prodigal return. going back, I'll never be the to serve your kingdom. We thank you for just the privilege it is to give and to trust you. Lord, your word says, 1 Chronicles 29, 11, that everything in heaven and earth belongs to you. So God, we just steward what you've put into our hands. Lord, may you find us faithful today as we worship through giving. 
I pray that you bless the gift and the giver, and that, Father God, you're pleased with what's given. May you be glorified in all of it, I pray, in Jesus' matchless name. Amen. Please be seated.
Father, we're thankful that, Lord, you are holy and that you are righteous. And, Lord, that you came over 2,000 years ago to bestow upon us that holiness and that righteousness. That today we're made right in you because of the blood of Jesus. And, Lord, we declare with the praises of heaven that he is holy, that he is just, that he's worthy of all praise. Lord, be in our midst as we come to your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, be seated and turn your attention to the screen if you would. I am a church member. I will strive to be a source of unity in the church. I know there's no such thing as a perfect pastor, perfect staff, or a perfect church member. I know that I'm not perfect either. I am a church member. I will not let this church be about my preferences and desires. I'm in this church to serve others and to serve Christ. I am a church member. I will pray for my pastor every day. His work is never ending and his days are filled with constant demand for his time. My pastor cannot serve our church in his own power. I will pray for God's strength for him and his family every day. I am a church member. Not the kind of membership as in a civic organization or a country club, but the kind of membership given to us in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, where Paul states that we're all the body of Christ and individual members of it. And I'm reminded that if one member suffers, then all the members suffer. If one member is honored, then all the members rejoice in it. I I'm a church member. I am a church member. I am a church member. My family and I will ask Christ to help us fall deeper in love with this church because he gave his life for her. This membership is a gift and I pray that I never take it for granted but that I see it as a gift and as an opportunity to serve others and to become a part of something greater than any one person or member. I am a church member. I'm a church member. I am a church member. A few of you, that's good. The rest of you, we'll keep praying for you. Well, if you're visiting this morning, we say welcome to First Baptist Church. Uh, my name is David Graham. I'm the new pastor here, and we're excited to be here in Twin Falls. A great job today, Mike, from the worship team. We appreciate all your effort. Uh, it's been a great week here at the church. A lot of things happening. On a personal note, uh, I got my office almost unpacked. Uh, we're making progress on the home. And, and Nicole and I and the kids, we just want to say thank you. We left yesterday to take Braden's best buddy back to the airport in Boise, and I spent the night overnight on Friday, came home, and our yard was clean. The, the weeds were pulled. So whoever you were, God bless you little yard fairies. Y'all are amazing. Uh, we were so excited to find that, and we're totally blessed. As far as the church is going, lots of stuff are starting to spin up. Our preschool starting back, so if you know somebody who's got small children and need in search of a good place, a safe place to come and bring their kids. Emily and her team's doing a great job, and they, but they always could use more children. Invite them to come and check out what's happening here at our church. It's good stuff. If you're here for the first time or you're visiting and you're interested in, in what's going on in the life of the church, on the 18th, right here at the church, we have our discovery class. We invite you guys to come and check that out. Also today, our small groups start, and if you haven't joined one of those, I encourage you to do that. It's a great place to be discipled and grow. If you've got questions about that, on either one of those things, see Mike Cook. He can fill you in. Uh, where's he at? He's, oh, he's upstairs. 
<laughs> so, so here's the thing. Go ahead and help us out on that and, and let us know if you're interested because we'd love to have you be involved in those. If you have your Bibles this morning, I invite you to turn to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. And then one other thing I'll remind you of, on the 29th of September, we're going to start back the, the fifth Sunday potlucks. And so, man, bring a dish, bring a dessert to share, and let's have some great time of fellowship together as we continue to grow and get to know one another. And don't get that on your calendar. Plan to stick around with us. Well, today we're in week two of our series, I'm a Church Member. And last week we looked at what it really means to be a part of a body that we're all called to serve, that we have gifts that we should be using to advance God's purposes and God's kingdom right here in our community and in this church. Every one of you have time, you have talent, you have treasure that God's given to you to be used for the advancement of his kingdom. And because we're a body, we need one another. So let's start there again this morning. Look at your neighbor and say, I'm glad you're here because I need you. Go ahead and tell them that right now. I'm glad you're here because I need you. Come on, you can say it to your siblings. It'll be good, all right? When I think about church, I think about team. Any of you guys, young or old, ever been on a team? Raise your hand so I know who I'm talking to. Do you win by individual effort, by an individual player, or do you win by a team effort? Team effort, that's right. And church is like a team. We win, we succeed, we advance God's kingdom when we, the individual players, cooperatively work together with a singular mind, a singular effort, a singular purpose, and that's what we want to focus on this morning. So often we, we start running in the same direction with the same goal, the same heart and mind, following what the coach is telling us, and that's usually the pastor in the church setting who listens to the owner who is Jesus. He gets the direction from the owner. He passes that direction on to the team, and we all start moving in the same direction. But what happens often in church is pretty soon we go, well, I don't like that. I don't, I don't like it that way. I don't like that song Mike did this morning, so I'm not going to sing. Well, I don't like the way he did it, so I don't, I'm just, I'm just going to stand here. We begin to think that church is about us and not about serving our Savior, who is Jesus. And when change starts happening, new things come, we kind of get our backs up because, like I said last week, nobody likes change. It's hard. You know, it's, it's difficult. But anything that has life changes and so change is necessary. But when someone decides to go on their own direction, again, we talked about this last week, the whole church begins to suffer because you're not doing your part. You're not pulling your weight. Remember when I loaded up on the Schultz kids and I was walking around? I could do that for a little bit. But then I was like, okay, he's heavy, get off. You know, you make the entire church pull you around when you don't invest, when you don't be a part, when you don't give of your time, talent, and treasure, the gifting that you are to the body. So I just want to challenge you this morning to, to recognize who we are, who we serve, and where we're headed. So let's take a look at the text and let's explore a little bit what Paul says about being the church. So we're looking again, if you have your Bibles, it's Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. Here's what Paul writes. He says, as a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of your calling that you've received. Every one of you have been called by God. We talked about this a little bit last week. Called by God, by the Holy Spirit, put here in this church. And you have ministry to do. Now, a lot of people say, well, you're, you're the minister. No, I'm the coach. I'm the pastor. I'm here to equip the saints. That's you for the work of the ministry. You have ministry. There's a calling on your life that needs to be fulfilled. And I encourage you, as Paul did this morning, to live a life that is worthy of of that calling, because it's no small thing. He goes on to say this. He says, be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing one another with love. Make every effort to keep unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. So this morning, we're talking about moving forward in unity. And how do we do that? How do we find the win in unity here at First Baptist Church? How do you find your place on the team? How do you get in the game so that Jesus, the owner, is glorified, so that his kingdom's purposes are advanced. And how do we do that in unity? Well, you have to determine, you have to choose. We talked about love last week. You have to choose to move forward in the bond of love. A unifying church member is someone who's known for their love. Jesus says it this way in John 13, 35. By all this, people will know that you're my disciples. For what? The love you have for who? One another. 
First and foremost, if we're going to be the church that God wants us to be here in Twin Falls, doesn't matter how good the I preach, doesn't matter how good the worship is, doesn't matter how good our programs are, if we don't love people, we will not succeed. When people come through the door, they need to know they're going to be loved, that they found a fellowship, that they found a family that can be faith, a family of faith to them. When they walk through the door first time, or you've been here a thousand times, we want you to experience authentic, genuine love. Man, we're going to hug your neck. We're going to shake your hand. You know, some people are like, well, I'm not a hugger. That's okay. We'll shake your hand. You know, we don't, we're, not, we're not going to make you feel weird. Well, maybe just a little. But, I mean, the thing is this, is we just want you to know that we care about you, that we're excited that you're here, that you would choose to be a part of what God's doing in this body and in these people. And we hope you'll be a part of that, that you'll join that. We want to be known as a church of love. We're, we're the church with heart, right? And so we want to demonstrate that when people come through the door. We want people to know that they're going to be loved, accepted, and forgiven when they come through these doors. Love is the core that binds us all together. And then when somebody walks through the door, we want them to know, I don't care if you're young or old, you're going to be accepted. Then we're going to care about you, and we're going to care about what's important to you. But then we also want you to know that no matter what your past has been, it's your past. We want you to know you've been forgiven. In this group, it may be a bit, a little bit different, but maybe not. Maybe as grandparents or, or parents, you've seen this. Anybody seen The Lion King? Do you remember the crazy monkey in The Lion King? Remember Rafiki? Remember when Simba's kind of down in, about his past and, oh, all the mistakes I've made and I can't believe this has happened and, oh, and I'm such a failure. And Rafiki takes a staff and walks up to him and smacks him in the head. Anybody remember that part? And, and Simba looks at him and goes, why did you do that? And he goes, it does not matter. It's in the past. What I want to tell you is your past, it does not matter. It's in the past. Jesus is a God of second, third, and fourth chances. He's a God of redemption, a God of restoration. He's a God of resurrection. It doesn't matter what your past looks like. It's in the past. It does not matter. Leave it there. When you come through the doors here at this church, you're going to find forgiveness in people who are going to love you. Why? Because we're God's disciples. And people will know that we're his by the love that we demonstrate and show to others. A unifying church member is one who's known for love. The second thing is this. A unifying church member does not gossip or engage in negative talk. Paul says it this way. Now, look, we always focus on the huge big sins, right? You know, oh, you killed somebody. Yeah, that's terrible, you know. Oh, you know, you've used illicit drugs. Oh, that's terrible. Oh, you were a drunk driver. Oh, that's terrible. But we don't like to talk about the stuff that impacts us, right? The stuff that we catch ourselves doing. You know, I read in the book once, and I think it's called the Bible, All Have Sinned. That means you. That means me. We've all sinned and fallen short of the expectation or the glory of God. And here's one that every one of us, if we're honest, we struggle with. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29, it says, Don't let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building up others according to their need, that it may benefit those who listen. <clears throat> Anybody ever get caught in gossip? Don't raise your hand. <laughs> it's okay. It's not confession today. It's, it's totally good. Here's what I want to tell you. All of us can get caught in this. Every one of us. I don't care how long you've been walking with the Lord. I don't care how little you've walked with the Lord. All of us can get caught in this. But I want to tell you that gossip is a killer. It kills unity. It kills cohesiveness. It kills trust. It kills cooperation. And it is one of the tools that the enemy uses to bring destruction to any life-giving and growing church. Gossip is a sin. Now, some of you are like, what? Yes, gossip is a sin, okay? And slander, maliciousness, God, God hates it, in fact. God hates when we do this. Any of you guys ever played the game telephone? Any, anybody ever played that? Listen, I can, I can tell, we could get in a circle around the room, and I could say a sentence in somebody's ears, and we could pass it around the room. And when it got back to me, it would not be what I said. That's what happens with gossip, you know, and in the church, we have this way of, of, of spreading gossip in a holy way. You know, we call because we need to share a prayer concern about someone with someone else. You're not really praying for them. You just want to talk about them. But it makes you feel better because you said pray for them. And at the end of the day, I just want to suggest to you, the Scripture tells us, don't let any wholesome talk come out of your mouth. And anytime you're spreading gossip, that's unwholesome. 
And it says, notice what it says, only what will build up others and be helpful according to the needs for those who are listening. Whether you realize it or not, when you're talking, other people are hearing what you're saying, whether you realize it or not. You're, if you're in Starbucks and you think, well, nobody knows, people are hearing what you say. Be careful what you say. In fact, let me give you a few more scripts about this because the Bible really speaks to this a lot. James 3.6 tells us that the tongue can destroy. It says, the tongue is also a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. Did you catch that? James says that your tongue can be a world full of evil. You can spew evil and hatred on somebody. It corrupts the whole body, sets its whole course of one's life on fire. It's set on fire by hell. That's pretty direct, isn't it? Then it goes on to say in Proverbs 10, 18, it says, don't be a source of gossip. It says, whoever conceals hatred with lying lips and slanders is a fool. The only person that looks bad when you gossip is you. You ever walked away from somebody who just gossiped to you and went, I wonder what they say about me when I'm not there? Anybody had that experience? Yeah, that's what happens when you talk about others because they begin to mistrust you. Then in 1 Peter 3.10, this is what it says. The tongue can be a source of life or death. It says, whoever desires to love life and see good days, let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. And in Proverbs 18.21, it says, the power of life and death are in the tongue. I want to challenge every one of you in the room as we go forward as a church. This is Sunday number two with me. We want to be life breathers meaning the words that come out of our mouth are encouraging and life-giving to others, that it benefits others when they hear us speak. We don't want to be death breathers. We want to be life breathers. So look at your neighbor and say, you need to start breathing life on people. Go ahead and tell them that right now. You need to start breathing life on people. So a unifying church member is an individual, someone who is known by their love, is known for being a life breather, not negative talk. The third thing is this. They promote unity by this, by being like-minded, by being one in spirit, by being a servant, being humble and interested in others. Here's what Paul says in Ephesians 2, 1 1 through 4. I'll get it out in a minute. It says, so if there's any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the spirit, any affection of sympathy, complete my joy, by, notice what he says, by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to your own interests, but the interests of others. Listen, you're going to be a unifying church member when we work with having a spirit of like-mindedness. Now, I'm not talking about being exactly the same. Unity can be diversified, but we got to have a like-mindedness. In other words, it's not about us. It's about Christ's kingdom. It's about advancing his kingdom and being willing to do whatever it takes to see that kingdom advanced and walked out week after week. we got to have that same goal, that same direction. I, I've given it to you three ways. we got to know who we are, meaning you got to understand who you are in Christ Jesus and what he's called you to do. you got to know who you serve. you got to understand you serve the King of kings, the Lord of lords, and there's nothing that's impossible for him to do. Nothing. Then you got to understand where you're headed every day. You got to understand that each morning, man, you need to get up. You got to spend some time with the Lord, or your day will not go the way it's supposed to. I'm going to give you a, a 15 minute rule for every day. Give God your first 15 minutes. Spend five minutes in the Word, five minutes in worship, and five minutes in prayer, and see how your life changes. Changes for the better. But we got to be like minded. We got to know who we are, know who we serve, and know where we're headed each day. We got to be of one spirit. Meaning we got to be unified by the Holy Spirit of God, that spirit that dwells in us. Every day the Bible says that we, when we meet with the Lord, that first 15 minutes, the Spirit of God indwells us and helps us to be encouraging and patient with one another and others. we got to seek to be a servant. How do I help? Where do I plug in? What is my role? What is the gift that God's given me to give back to this body? Man, if we're going to be all that God's called us to be, we need all of you, young and old alike, on mission being the people God's called you to be. And you do that humbly. Listen, I'll never ask you as a pastor to do something I'm not willing to do myself. I still scrub toilets. I still mop floors. Man, I'm going to be in there serving alongside of you. 
But we got to go and move this thing together. We got to move forward in God's purposes in unity. And you do that through humility by looking at other people going, how do I serve? How do I love these folks to the best of my ability? Then finally, be interested, authentically interested in others. Jesus says it this way. He says, let your love be genuine. Don't just say you love people, but truly love them. You know, what are other people's interests? What do they care about? What are they passionate about? What do they love to do? Man, do you just attend church with other people, or are you the church? Are you a body? Are you a family that knows one another and knows what's going on in each other's lives? I'm not talking about being nosy Nellies. I'm talking about just loving on one another, being passionate, doing things together. You know, I know John loves to do leather work. I'm excited to go see that. I'm excited to find out how you do that and how you do things and tool those things together, man. So I'm going to come spend some time with you at the shop. I know you like to do woodwork. There's two or three guys here in the building that love to do wood stuff. I think we're going to make a small group on woodworking, and you guys can show me how to do it. I mean, you know, it's just it's one of those things that interests me. And so I'm going to spend some time trying to get to know you guys, but I want to encourage you to get to know one another. You can't value another person until you know who they are. And so we're going to spend some time together. That's why we're going to do those fifth Sunday potlucks. Because the more time you spend together, I don't care if you've gone to the church 100 years or if you've gone here for five minutes. At the end of the day, the more time you spend together, the more you love one another, the more family you become, the more you can tolerate the Uncle Eddie's. You, you know what I'm talking about? Anybody seen Christmas Vacation? You know, the Uncle Eddie shows up. Well, there's a few Uncle Eddies here. I promise every church has them. And if you're like, I don't know who that is, it's probably you. So, I mean, you know. But, but the deal is, we want to have some time together, and we got to be interested in one another. If we're going to be a church, a body of believers working together, we got to be unified in all those areas. Then finally, we need to be unified under purpose, and I want to show you where the church's purpose lies. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and flip over to Acts chapter 2. We're going to look at verse 42 to 47. This is how we're to do church. This, this is the model. And this is what I, I call learning to become dangerous disciples because you start living this, and it'll change your life. It'll move you from casual Christianity into living a dangerous walk for the Lord. Here's what Scripture records, and it says, And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, the breaking of bread, and prayer. And all came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together, and they had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all who had any need. And day by day, they attended the temple together, breaking bread in their homes. They received their food and with glad and generous praising to God, having favor with all the people. And the Lord, notice what it said, added to their number daily those who were being saved. Listen, a person who's going to be a dangerous disciple, a person who is going to make a difference in the kingdom of God, number one, is going to be devoted to the word of God. In other words, you're going to read the word every day, and you're going to say, how does this apply to me? And you're going to seek to align your life to its precepts and teachings. In other words, if you're a husband, you're going to look at what Paul says in Ephesians, and you're going to try to become a husband who loves his wife as Christ loved the church. If you're a wife, you're going to try to become that Proverbs 31 woman that is honored above all things, that's precious and valued above all things. If you're a child who's going to honor God in your household, you're going to learn to honor and respect your parents. Do what they ask you to do because that comes with a blessing. Your life will be lengthened and it will go well with you. You know, if your parent ever got upset with you and said, I brought you into this world, I can take you out, that's biblical. That, that's where that comes from. Honor your father and mother. It comes with a blessing. Your life will be lengthened and it will go well with you. You don't, you might die. I'm just saying. The, the reality is this. People keep trying to tell me that the word of God is outdated. No, it is as relevant today as it's ever been in human history. And the only people that ever say it's outdated and irrelevant are people who spend no time in it. We're going to devote ourselves as a church to the word of God. We're going to grow. We're going to learn. It's going to stretch us. And I don't care if you're young. I don't care if you're old. You can never stop learning. It's, the word of God is inexhaustible, and you can learn something new every day. We're going to devote ourselves to prayer. We're going to be a church that prays. Because I'm going to tell you that I've learned that prayer moves heaven and earth. You believe that this morning? Okay, about five of you. That's good. It's a good start. We'll get the rest of you on board later. Prayer 
moves heaven and earth on God's behalf. And prayer is what calms your heart. Prayer is what assures your spirit. Prayer is what gets you close to God. Prayer is what helps when you don't know what else to do. And so we're going to be a church that is devoted to prayer. We're going to be a church that is devoted and lives a lifestyle of worship. And you go, well, what does that mean? <clears throat> this will be the first time but not the last time you hear me say this. If you can get more excited at a football game than you can a worship service, there's something out of order and wrong in your life. I'm not trying to pick on you. I'm just telling you the truth. If you can go to the big blue game and you can get all excited at the big blue turf, when those guys score and you can go, woo, and you can run around and high-five everybody down the thing, you know, I'm just telling you, if you get more excited because some fat guy you never met crossed a chalk line with a dead pig in his hand, then the Lord Jesus who saved your eternal soul and has, has rescued you from hell and from death and from sin, there's something wrong with that. I'm serious. If you're willing to raise your hands for your team and shout for your team but not for God, something needs to change in your life. Somebody asked me today, they said, why do you have this little rubber mat down here? Because I have bad knees, but I came to worship the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And Scripture says every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. On some Sundays, I'll be on my knees before God. Because that's what Scripture says is a part of my worship to the Lord. I'm going to humble myself before God. We're not going to be a people who is apologetic for exuberant worship for God. Now listen, people all the time go, well, if you raise your hand in church, that's Pentecostal. Give me a break. That's worship. If you clap your hands, let, let me ask you this. If you go to the, the local country and western show, you go to the radio or the rodeo, do you clap your hands? Do you pat your toe? You might even do this number right here, right? If you can't worship God that way, but you can worship out there doing that, something's wrong. Something's wrong. Now, there are times that we are called to reverence and stillness and quietness before God. But I read more in Scripture that says, give a shout unto God, lift a shout of praise before God with loud clanging cymbals before the... I mean, listen, the Psalms are full of what God calls worship, and we're going to live a lifestyle of worship here in this church. We're going to be people who exuberantly worship God. And maybe you've never done it before, and we'll talk more about what that looks like. But, man, I, I just want to tell you, you go, well, that makes me uncomfortable. Good, because you need to be stretched. Listen, if, if you've been walking with Jesus for 40, 50 years and you haven't been stretched for a while, it's time to stretch a little bit because we're called to glory and to glory and to glory. And I just want to encourage you that, man, there's nothing like exuberant people, excited people for God to attract other people. I hope you understand that. Listen, nobody wants to go to church where you meet them at the grocery store and they're like, we want to invite you down to First Baptist so you can be excited for Jesus like me. Nobody wants to go to that church, okay? I'm just telling you. But there's an exuberance and there's an excitement in your spirit about what, who and what God's doing in your life. People will want to be around it. It is contagious. But we got to start living a lifestyle of worship. Then finally, Acts 2 tells us this. we got to engage in fellowship, not with just one another. That's important. We're going to do that. But you got to start inviting your friends. One of the purposes of small groups, I call them life groups, one of the reasons we have those is to get your unchurched friends and some of your people who are maybe lost to come to your house, eat a meal with you, and then engage other believers. Or people who may not be there, people who are not of faith, engage people of faith. You know, it's intimidating to walk into it. When's the last time any of you, anybody visited a new church? Raise your hand if, if, if you're visiting. You know, here's what I want to tell you. You don't count. We just moved here. All right, here's the thing. It's intimidating to walk through the doors because you're like, I don't know where, if you have kids, I don't know where the nursery is. I don't even know if they have child care. Here, here's a good one. I don't know where the bathrooms are. I'm I'm serious. When you walk through the door the first time and you're visiting, you have no idea. You're like, I know they're probably around here somewhere. At least I hope they are. You know, the, the truth is it can be a very intimidating thing. And we need to be a church of fellowship. We need to be inviting people in. And often people won't come to the church, but they'll come to your house and they'll definitely come for food. That's why you do small groups, to help evangelize, to reach to, and, and bring people in that would not normally come through the doors. And once they start knowing folks, then they'll start showing up for church. 
the bigger corporate body thing. And you're like, well, we're not a very big church yet. Well, I understand, but we will be. I'm believing God for that. How about you? Well, at least there's two or three of you. We'll pray for the rest of you, you know. At the end of the day, we really want to be a church that has great expectations. We want to be a people who are pushing and moving toward what the Word of God describes as the living, breathing church. We want to be engaged in fellowship. And notice that the the promise that's there. God adds to the number those who will be saved. If we'll do this, if we'll devote ourselves to the Word, to prayer, to fellowship, to worship, to engaging those outside of our fellowship, God will bring people in. See, we mistakenly think it's about the worshiper, it's about the preacher. Do you know that, here's what the studies, and I read studies all the time. Barna says that people decide within the first two minutes whether they'll ever return to church or not. Well, in the first two minutes, you're not going to hear the singing and preaching. The first two minutes is when you walk through the door and somebody shakes your hand and hugs your neck. You'll decide whether you're going to come back or not based upon your initial experiences coming through the door. I love what Ray says. He goes, I've visited other churches and not a soul spoke to me. But when I can, they come to the door and when people say, how are you doing? I'm going to say, I'm doing great. I'm doing fine. I'm doing wonderful. I'm glad you're here. And he always greets you with a smile. I love that. I'm glad you're at the door, brother. We want to grow the church, not shrink the church. If you're a grumpy old person, please don't be that person. Greeting, we're glad you're here this morning. Or, you know, they just want, here's your bulletin. We don't want that, man. We want people to experience genuine, authentic love. We want to be a church that is known for its love. We want to be a church that is known for investing and engaging in fellowship with one another. And if we'll do those things, the Lord will add to our numbers those who are being saved. Then finally, we're done this morning. We want to be a church that is intentional in unity. We want to protect the unity that God's given us. That's important. Why? Turn in your Bibles to Psalm 133, verse 1, and then we're going to look at verse 3b. But in Psalm 133, Here's what the scripture says, and I I think it's such an important thing for us. It says, behold, how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity. The core of that, we talked about this already, is love. The core of that is seeking to serve others. And then if you jump down to verse 3, part B, here's what it says. For there the Lord commands a blessing. If we'll be of unity of heart and mind, of spirit, of direction and purpose, God will command his blessing to reside here among us. How many of you would love to live in God's blessing? I know I want to. And right here is the key. To be people of love, people of purpose, people who are rooted in truth and faith in the word of God, praying for one another, worshiping God exuberantly, It says, God will add to our numbers because he's commanding a blessing here. That's the kind of church I want to be involved in. Yes? Listen, I'm going to say it to you this way. I I, I speak to you because I want you to talk back to me. Um, I I want a church to be full of life and exuberance. You know, it's like when I say good morning and five people go, good morning. You know, I'm like, okay, they're all dead or asleep. I mean, when I say good morning, I want it to be like, good morning. I mean, I want, because people want to be a part of a church that has life in it. The people are, and that has nothing to do with age or youthfulness. It's, it's what's in here. That that's what we're looking for. Man, I have just a passion for God, his purpose, and his people. And we want to be that church. And this morning, I, I, we're looking at this series because I want you to realize God will not do in us corporately what he won't do within you individually. And if you've got a heart for revival and you've got a passion for people and you've got a passion for God and his purposes, it catches, it spreads. Excitement comes, revival will come, and we'll watch God do miraculous things here in the life of this church. Things you've been praying for, believing for, God can do it today. Look at your neighbor and say, God's got great things for us. Let's trust him. Go ahead and tell him that right now. God's got great things for us. Let's trust him. On that, let's pray together. Father, I thank you for who you are, and I thank you for your word this morning. I thank you for its truth. It's truth that transforms. It's truth that changes. It's truth that makes a difference in who we are when we embrace it. And Lord, this morning, I pray that we would embrace your truth, that, Father God, we would seek to align our lives according to your word and purpose. Lord, today, I pray that we would not, Father God, take our eyes off of you, that we would keep them firmly on you today. 
And Lord, I pray that, that you'd be honored, that your kingdom would be advanced in us and through us. In Jesus' name, amen.